pounds. Four county champions to go with this tremendous team. So uh, boys, you can come on up. <laughs> Coach Serrano, Coach Shippos. All right, thank you, Mr. Pirapato. We appreciate your support along with the administration on a fine season. I'll call you guys one by one, receive your certificate, and I'd like to thank the coaches, the parents, and the athletes. All conference, Christopher Angelos. Two time all conference, Nicholas Antonello. All conference freshman, Carlos Arango. <laughs> Two time all conference, Ryan Pachacolupo. <laughs> Third in New York State, Anthony Canetta. <laughs> Three time all conference, scholar athlete, Kyle Donahue. Ended his career with 199 wins, four-time more county, Nassau County champion, champion of champions, Gary Gibbons. <laughs> Sophomore, baseball player, wrestler, Ryan Howard. <laughs> Three-time more conference, just a freshman, Alex Giuliani. Second in Nassau County, excellent year, team leader, Thomas Greenblatt. <laughs> Sixth in New York State, second in Nassau County. Probably one of the more exciting guys to watch wrestle, Michael Blando, CW Pulse Division One next year. <laughs> All conference sophomore, Dominic Casarcina. Two-time All-County team leader, John Casmusino. <laughs> Freshman, Jake Sigalino. <laughs> Freshman brother, twin, Luke Sigalino. <laughs> All-Conference, All-County Track, All-Conference Wrestling, Luke Jarski. Scholar Athlete Award winner, plays four sports, 99 average, fifth in Nassau County, Dan Kaysen. <laughs> Two-time All-Conference, football player, wrestler, Frank Kempton. <laughs> Two-time All-Conference, junior, Jack Ch Kirschbaum. All conference, eighth grade, Joseph Kupner. <laughs> Senior wrestler, Alexander Lee. <laughs> Two time All State, second New York State, fourth in New York State, scholar athlete, Chase Liardi. Sophomore, Liam Mahoney. <laughs> Sophomore or conference, Cal Milano. Fifth in Nassau County, Sal Minicello. Two-time New York State qualifier, second in Nassau County, third in Nassau County, Marco Musso, playing football at Sudi Cortland.
two-time All-Conference, Daniel O'Callaghan. <laughs> all Long Island football, All-American lacrosse, second New York State, student, uh, Cornell University, Angelo Petraki. Two-time All-Conference, Bill Piatti. <laughs> Junior, Andrew Ryder. All-Conference, football player, wrestler, Michael Rollo. Two-time All-County, New York State qualifier, second in Nassau County, coming back for his senior year, Jeremy Scudelero. <laughs> Two-time All-County, only family to have three All-Conference wrestlers in one weight class at 285, that was done a couple years ago, Matthew Smithwick. <laughs> Same family. Same concept, William Smithwick. <laughs> Studying to be a pilot, senior, two-time all-conference, Thomas Styler. <laughs> senior, Frank Tarasi, football and wrestling. First off, I'd like to thank the coaches. We have Howie Greenblatt, Mike Buchan, Kevin Schiffos, and James Andres. You guys are chosen on integrity, and to be honest, you are the foundation of everything. You guys are role models to these kids, and there's no rhyme or reason of why they didn't get the job done, because you guys are leading the way. I'd also like to thank the parents and the athletes, something I've been thinking about. I use the word proud a lot, because I am. I'm a very proud man. It's not because of what you did, it's because how you did it. Listen, I'm with you, uh, 2019 New York State champion, county titleist, scholar athlete, that's great. But it's not what you did, it's how you did it, it's the class. You know how many people came up to me and said, what a classy team that was? And that's like the best compliment a man can get. I mean, everyone loves a guy who can like think with their head and, and fight with their fists and handle their wins and losses. I mean, it's a fighting wrestling, fighting, blood, sweat, tears, and to handle the emotions with class like that, thumbs up. And that's a tribute to everyone. That's parents, that's coaching, that's the community. Say hello to your 2019 New York State Champions, Mass Speaker Wrestling. It's an amazing season, uh, gentlemen. Mr. Taylor said he could beat Garrett, though, at 152 <laughs> when he was wrestling for the Chiefs back in 81, so I don't know. Sounds like a challenge, Garrett. He's ready. Mr. Taylor's ready. He just has to train for a week, he said. <laughs> Boys, uh, Coach will give you those shirts outside. Um, congratulations once again. We'd like to thank the parents, our coaches, and our student athletes for all their hard work and dedication. Uh, it's more than a three-month season. Um, it's almost 11 months now. Uh, thank you again to our administration and Board of Education for uh, helping us celebrate our success. Have a good evening. And uh, thank you, Mr. Pirapato, for all you do. Thank you. Absolutely phenomenal job, guys, gals. We, all, we couldn't be prouder of all the coaches and athletes. And the, the one thing that I didn't hear a clap for that I was totally impressed with was every single one of them were student athletes. So. That's absolutely phenomenal. Yep. Okay, next item on the agenda is the minutes approval from the regular meeting, March 7th, 2019. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number four, personnel, certificate of personnel action. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? 
All in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Any Mr. Abstain? Taylor? Yes. Yes. Have one? Yes, may I uh, make my a apologies. few comments? This evening, um, well, actually, the board has just accepted the retirement of two of our wonderful principals on the elementary level. Mr. Steven Scarallo um, will be retiring uh, at the end of the year, as, well as will Mrs. Lori Dano. Steve came to us back in 2003 as the Burner principal. He served in that capacity from 2003 through 2010 and then went on to the Lockhart principalship in 2010 and will retire at the end of this year. Um, he's a beloved principal uh, at both of those locations and we thank him for his years of service. Uh, Lori Dano. Lori came to us in 2005 and she served at only for one year as the assistant principal at McKenna School. She then went on to the Lockhart principalship from 2006 through 2014, and then will retire as the from the Fairfield School as principal there from 2014 to the present. Now, of course, we will um, in May uh, during our celebration of tenure as well as retirement speak a little bit more thoroughly and deeply about these two very uh, unique individuals and uh, people that we will sorely miss. They were principal colleagues along with me, so if for me it's, it's, it's even a little bit more special. So we, we congratulate them, we wish them years of happiness and health and doing anything they wanna do. So congratulations to Mr. Scarello and Mrs. Dana. Thank you very much and I had the privilege and pleasure of having both of those principals as uh, principals for my children, absolutely phenomenal people. We're gonna wish, we're gonna miss them something terribly. We're gonna wish them a long, happy, healthy retirement. Thank you. Okay, the next item is number five, personnel non-certificated. May I have motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, I'll now kick it off to Mrs. Iconis. I'm back. Okay, well, when I walked in to the room this evening, Marie showed me her socks. Right, Marie? Because today is Rock Your Socks because it's World Down Syndrome Day, March 21st. So thank you to SEPTA and uh, to everyone who participated in our programs across the district. And then what I'd like to do is just take a moment because I know that this has... This topic has been something that we've been kicking around for quite some time. Uh, as many of you know, here in the audience, um, there was a uh, elementary focus group in the area of mathematics that actually worked for well over a year and a half. Uh, I have received their recommendation. Uh, the, the committee was comprised of teachers, administrators, um, along with Mrs. Summers, Tony Ann Summers, our curriculum associate uh, for mathematics, and our math coaches. And the recommendation for the kindergarten through fifth grade is actually to go to a program. Um, the program is entitled Ready Mathematics. It is authored by Curriculum Associates Company. Uh, it is rated number one in Ed Reports. The teachers felt very comfortable with this program because it really does align to what we have been doing, the depth that we are trying to achieve, the conceptual understanding for our youngsters, um, and it will support uh, the development of a deep and connected understanding of mathematics. So we're very excited to announce that. We will be working with the teachers uh, for professional development and training on this program, and we are preparing to launch it in September of 2019. So that is the committee's recommendation, and I um, absolutely support that, okay? <coughs> and I have some samples on the table, so if you wanna come up and take a peek at the end of the meeting, please, uh, uh, please do so. So thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to number six, the informational items. First one up is AP Capstone Review with Dr. Brian Capani.
thank you to the Board of Education, Mrs. Iconis, and District Administration for this opportunity uh, to share with you this exciting program that we've been offering at Massapequa High School. It's so exciting that I thought all of the students here tonight were here to actually listen to this presentation. Um, however, some of the student athletes that were here tonight are also students in this program too, whether they're on the bowling team, track and field, or wrestling. So. It was heartening to see them here tonight also getting awards for their accomplishments in, uh, in athletics as well. Um, the reason why I'm here tonight is to talk to you about this program. It's a program that was introduced to us, uh, introduced to really the world through College Board about two years ago. Um, I'm sorry, four years ago in 2014. September of 2014, College Board first developed this program and had it uh, run in schools that school year. After that, we put forth an application and in the spring, in the fall of 2016 was the first year that we actually ran the AP Capstone program. The AP Capstone program consists of two courses. So the program is called Capstone but the courses are called AP Seminar and AP Research. The courses are sequential which means students need to take the AP Seminar course before they take AP Research. We offer them here right at uh, Massapequa High School main campus and Currently, we have over 170 students in the program this year. Our first year of implementation, we had 76 students in the AP seminar program. And I'm going to speak in detail tonight about this program and what these students participate in and really why this program is so prestigious and how it prepares them for college. Um, but also the skills they develop along the way, uh, which really makes this program unique. As we can see here, um, on that first year, 2016-17, we didn't have any students in the AP Research Program because it is sequential. Uh, I'm also going to talk about why the numbers for 2017-18 uh, dipped a bit in seminar and we only had five students last year. That was a programming decision that we made as, a, as an administrative team that showed the numbers spike up this year to about 175 students in the program. Because of that, it's really important for us as leaders, as educators, and really as a community as we go forward to be mindful of this. And really this is just a long-winded way of saying that we're here to challenge our students but certainly support them as we do. Um, this message here is one that we really kind of take to heart with the AP Capstone program, that we want to make sure that the students we educate overall and particularly through this program are given opportunities to showcase themselves as scholars on par with any students in this country and around the world. But as we do that, we also want to make sure as a community, as educators, as an administration that we give the students all the support they need to be able to achieve those goals. And that's certainly what we do with this program and really that's what we strive to do, especially as the numbers grow. So the program really consists of these areas and if you look up here, what you'll see is that this is not like a typical high school class. What the students are expected to do is more on par with what ultimately students would be asked to do in college. They're giving presentations as a team. They're speaking in front of an audience. And when they go into AP research, they're writing an academic paper with a panel to actually review their findings. And it's so impressive to see these students present. And I'm going to show you a clip, a few seconds of a few students as we go through the presentation of them completing their AP seminar and AP research requirements. Now, there are a few goals to the program. A lot of them are goals that they'll, foundational goals that they'll meet along the way. But the ultimate goal for many of these students and the reason why we offer the program is the attainment of the AP Capstone Diploma. The AP Capstone Diploma means that a student was able to succeed in the AP Seminar class, the AP Research class, and then also in four other AP classes that students may take along the way. The five students who completed the program, I have a sample of what their course load looked like so you would be able to see how attainable that, that distinction would be for students here in Massapequa High School. Um, so again, students would fulfill the requirements of AP Seminar, AP Research, and then four other AP courses. Now, as we prepare students to achieve that goal, we want to make sure that we're not shortchanging them in their other courses. And ultimately, we also want to create this complementary environment where students are actually uh, demonstrating the same skills in AP Capstone that they would in their other courses. And when we're asking students to construct and deconstruct arguments, to really understand the process of learning, 
this slide shows that when we're talking about other disciplines, whether it's social studies, math, science, or English, what's expected of them to complete be on the AP seminar exam is pretty similar to what the expectations are on the exams in these courses as well. And that's heartening to us because we want to make sure that, like I said, we do create a complementary environment for learning for these students um, because ultimately that will help them ensure success as they go forward. Now, as they try to achieve the AP Capstone Diploma, students that get themselves involved in this program um, come from a variety of interests. And this list shows all of the programs that we offer here at Massapequa High School and the Ames campus included. So whatever your interest is, you do have an opportunity to take those AP seminar, AP research courses, and then also other courses that you might be interested in in an attempt to actually obtain the AP Capstone Diploma. Now, one of the reasons why we, that number jumped from five to 78 as we moved from the 2017-18 school year to the 2018-19 school year was we made a decision to actually have AP Capstone count as part of our core English credit. Uh, in 2017-18, the course um, was, on, it was in students' schedules as an elective. So students would take another English class as their core class. We realized that by offering AP Capstone Research as a core English class, it would give us an opportunity to have more students enroll in the program. And ultimately, we saw that number jump from five to 78, which really puts the requirements on us to provide more support to the students as they go forward and ultimately succeed. So this slide right here shows students in the English program um, as they would go through their high school career and how they would be able to actually take the AP Capstone course as part of their English program. And ultimately, there's a lot of arrows up there, a dizzying amount of arrows, but basically more arrows mean more choices for students. So uh, if that's one takeaway from the slide, that would be in addition to the uh, fact that students can take this as their core English class. Now, the goal is the AP Capstone Diploma. And as students go to achieve it, there are other foundational milestones that student can reach along the way. Is this course helping them to get college and career readiness skills? Is this course helping them develop an exceptional high school transcript? And is this course helping them receive college credit? So all of these things are fundamental goals of the course in addition to actually having students get the KP Capstone Diploma. And now I'll talk a little bit about those college uh, and readiness skills that students develop. This slide here has a lot of educational jargon on it. But what this slide shows is that one of the goals of the course is to have students work together, to collaborate, to question, to build upon their foundation of knowledge. And students who are able to do that will be successful, whether they go to a highly competitive college, whether they go into the workforce, or throughout the rest of their life. So really what we're developing through this program, in addition to preparing them for uh, whatever institution they go to after high school, it's those career skills that we're trying to develop in them as well. AP Capstone Seminar is represented here. Um, I like this slide in the middle because one of the things that we did early on with the students, because they need to work together, and they need to work together at a high level, students really need to interact with each other on an academic level. Um, so this is, in that center slide, what we called research speed dating, where students would, would meet across from each other and actually talk to each other about what their interests are, how they would conduct research on a particular topic to see where the best fits were as they started to develop their team project. Now, that team project is based upon students deciding on what topic they would want to present about. But the key here is students being able to work together. So as we begin the program, the ultimate goal of the program are these lofty uh, expectations that represent what students would need to do in college. But they're 15 and 16 years old. So what we do in the beginning through AP seminars is we walk them through a variety of activities where they interact with each other. We get them in front of the room. We get them to try to problem solve together. And ultimately, we get them to a point where they start conducting research with each other. This is more of a, uh, the type of slide that you would see as students move through the program where they're developing a research question on a topic that they're interested in. And really that's the key here, that as the students meet that first goal in AP seminar, they're actually presenting on a topic that they're interested in. 
And, and, and that's really the beauty of this program and the beauty of uh, providing this opportunity to the students is that students get to research on a topic that they're interested in. And what they ultimately do is they decide the topic that they're interested in, the information that they find about the topic, their level of understanding of the topic. And really for any of us, the level of understanding we have for any, of any topic has to do with the perspective we have on the topic and the lens in which we look through it. And ultimately when the students present, they'll each take a uh, different lens of that topic and that's how they'll present in front of the group. So it's usually in teams of four or five. They have an overarching theme and then they've looked through it through different perspectives. Uh, an example of it, and I'm not going to show this video because then it's ultimately gonna be the Wolf presentation, but what I will do is tell you that one of the things we do with the students is we show this video. And this video is about wolves being re-released into Yellowstone National Park. Now on the surface, you're re-releasing a predator into a national park. It doesn't sound like the best idea. However, what this video shows is that regardless of the lens you're looking at, whether you're looking at it through someone who's a conservationist or someone who's looking out for the well-being of the wolves or someone who's looking out for the well-being of the prey, or all of the other species of animals that now get reintroduced to the park now that the elk are on the move because they're being chased by wolves. Students look at that and realize that beneath the surface of a topic, there's so many different perspectives that you can look at it through. And by looking at a topic through all those different perspectives, it encourages dialogue and encourages students to talk about their point of view and ultimately present it when they actually give their presentation. So this is a sample of a presentation. I'm only gonna show it for a few minutes and, oh, I'm sorry, a few seconds. And part of it is, thank you. Part of it is to show off the amazing library. All right. And also, okay. thank you. However, this, this can also, we think it's like a hidden focus, an artificial organ. People in the wilderness now have a chance to use the organ chance for a couple of weeks as well as give it a second chance at life. The artificial beauty organ also help eliminate the inequalities of wilderness. With the wilderness, it becomes... The goal wasn't really to have you guys actually watch it to a point where you're, you're getting a full understanding of what they're presenting. It's really to show you um, what one of the expectations is for this program in AP Seminar, and this is really the first assessment that we have with the students. They're in teams of four and five uh, in early January. We have them present in the library. All right. Okay, three, two. What the students do is they rotate through and they're presenting for eight to 10 minutes on a topic. This topic is about artificial organs. And each of these students looked at the topic of artificial organs through a different lens. And through that different lens, they were able to present on the impact artificial organs would have on the people who require organ transplants. The students came up with the idea of that topic on their own. They got together as a group. They wrote a paper each through looking through it a different lens and ultimately created this presentation that they gave. Um, and it's really, when we look at this, it's so impressive. And it's so impressive that students are actually on camera actually working together to present on a topic that's as, as intricate as this one and as important to humanity. However, in addition to that, it really shows that really some of the benefits of this program, both in high school and how these kids are developing as humans and ultimately uh, students as they move forward. The second topic for AP seminar that the students need to um, complete is their individual research. Their individual research is based on a packet of stimulus materials they get in early January. Now, ultimately what they need to do is read that and determine what the overarching theme is in those stimulus materials. In this case, when we look at these topics, the students had to come to terms with the fact that this is all about perseverance. And the great thing about this is that the stimulus materials that the students are reading, as you can see, represent a lot of different disciplines. And the students then determine what kind of presentation they would want to give based on using these stimulus materials in their presentation. In 2018, it was about perspective and this year, it's about progress. So students were giving these materials in early January. 
they're going to present their research in April using this material to actually come up with an argument and a level of analysis based on the idea of progress. They're not complete yet, but here's a sample of some of the topics our AP seminar students are going to actually present to us in April. To what extent has overpopulation impacted the lives of its Chinese citizens? And in addition to doing research on that, ultimately in their presentation, they'll need to weave in examples from uh, the, um, these materials here to support their findings. This is a student from two years ago who did her presentation on Oedipus for Perseverance. It's really deep, so. Once students are completed with AP Seminar, it, they move on to AP Research. If they take AP Seminar in 10th grade, they have an opportunity to take AP Research in either 11th or 12th. Or if they take Seminar in 11th, they would take Research in 12th. AP Capstone Research has one requirement, an academic paper. I didn't write my first academic paper until I was 19. And these students are doing it as 16 year olds and it's pretty impressive. Uh, the paper is 4,000 to 5,000 words. And then in addition to that, the students need to complete a 15 to 20 minute oral defense. As I showed you with those numbers, we had five students complete that last year. Uh, we have over 70 students looking to complete that this year. Uh, and they'll be doing those presentations in early April in the library on their topics. These are some of their topics, and again, the students were able to develop whatever topic they were interested in, and it represents all of the di different disciplines that are out there. And the great thing about this is that students are able to conduct research in a topic of their choosing and actually ultimately develop a 4,000 to 5,000 word paper and presentation on that. Part of the requirements, in addition to a pretty extensive literature review, is also students actually conducting their own action research, which means they study, they look at data that's out there, and they really determine um, with a deep level of analysis um, what some of the um, limitations are of their study, what some of the conclusions they came up with, and really were they able to answer their research question. Um, now, because I talked about the fact that we have upwards of 70 students trying to complete this task, and this is a long-winded way of saying challenge students, but also support them. We have the help of 39 different teachers here at the, at the high school, at Ames, and at the middle school to be advisors to our students. And you can see that it spans across multiple disciplines, 39 teachers working one-on-one -on -one with our high school students to really help them complete this task. And it's heartening to see teachers and students working one-on-one -on -one really talking about academic research on a very high level. Here are a couple of examples of students who um, presented last year. So one student did um, his presentation on why pediatric brain tumors receive a lack of funding from the National Cancer Institute. That was a real topic that she wrote a 4,000 to 5,000 word paper on and did a 15 to 20 minute presentation on. Um, the presentation is here. I'm going to keep moving it forward. But obviously, it's pretty impressive that the students were able to actually create these presentations. Another student did his on the potential bias of year-round education and willingness of individuals to conform to this system. So he wrote 4,000 to 5,000 words to basically come up with students don't want year-round education. In order to receive the AP Capsule and Diploma, I went through some of the requirements. I just want to quickly go through some of the academic profiles of our students so you can see how they were able to get there. So student A, I'm going to show you, these are the actual accomplishments of this student. The student is going to Ohio State University next year. The student completed the AP Capsule and Diploma. diploma. 25 applicants were accepted into that program. Thousands applied, 50 uh, participated in an interview and she's one of the 25 that are going. Now, it's a pretty unique profile when you look at this. This is the students' courses um, from 10th and 11th grade and also the courses they're taking in 12th. The number to the right is what the students scored uh, from AP. It's on a zero to five scale. If you get a three or higher, it counts towards the AP capstone diploma. So this student took AP seminar and AP research in 10th and 11th grade. This student took all of these courses and received the three or higher in them, earning the distinction of an AP Capstone Diploma. Now, this is what the course counted for 
in, a, in, in her profile. I just wanted to show you very quickly that everything that's highlighted right now was a core class that the student needed to take anyway. It's not that the student was actually taking up room in her schedule, taking courses that she needed to for AP Capstone, and it prevented her from taking others. These were all core courses. The only exception was AP Research where it's labeled as an elective there because as I mentioned, we didn't offer it as a core course until this year. Um, obviously this feedback is positive from her and the impact it had on the program, uh, the program had on her and her ability to be able to um, get into the school of her choice and the program that she wanted to get into. I'm going to go through a few more students because it's a wide range of academic profiles but all of them went through the AP Research program. So again, AP Seminar and AP Research in 10th and 11th grade. Student took these courses and student talked about how this program really helped him as he prepared for college. Student three, he's an AP scholar, took these courses. Now, these students, C, D, and E, um, go through a wide range of, of students in that AP scholar model. The student scored a two on AP research but also has threes and fours in these areas, which will also help him going forward. And all five of these students talked about the value that this program had for them and in their ability to write their college applications and ultimately prepare for their college interviews. And really what's interesting would be to follow up with these five students and the other 25 seniors we have taking AP research this year uh, in December of 2019 to see how they felt their first semester went and our goal is to maintain contact with them to see the long range benefits of this program. Student D. Now, we offer AP research in 11th grade. In 11th grade, every student takes the English region, so we weren't sure how a program that really revolves around a lot of nonfiction test, text and real world studies, how students would be able to do on the English regions where it, you know, literature is a key component of it. So these scores, oh, my shading is too light. Uh, ultimately, the bottom line is the students did really well. This shows, and uh, you know, in addition to overseeing the AP Capstone uh, program, I also oversee the social studies program. And I wanted to see the correlation between students who take AP Seminar and students who take AP World. The number to the right, the three point decimal, a three or higher is, is, a, is a pretty significant score on the AP exams. So the students who took both AP Seminar and AP World in 2017 performed significantly better than students who didn't. In 2018 we saw the same effect, that students who took AP Seminar and World, the 38 students performed significantly better. Now, Neighboring districts have been visiting Massapequa High School for the last two years. This is just a representation of some of the visitations that have happened recently. South Country, Lindenhurst, and Bayport, Blue Point have come in to really see our program in action because of the success, because of the amount of students we have in the program, and because of our efforts to try to provide as much support as we can for our students so they can succeed in this very unique pro program. So here's an example of some of the visitations. Um, this tip from AP Capstone was basically that this program from College Board, obviously talking about the benefits this program would have for the students uh, as they look to college. Now it's from College Board, so we take it with a grain of salt. However, what we do know is this. We know that some of the more prestigious local institutions like Columbia, like Fordham, and like NYU have gone out and said that they think that the AP Capstone program does help prepare students for college, and they certainly recognize it as one that would put their applicants um, in a better light as they um, apply to those schools. In addition, I wanted to hear what our students were saying. So I interviewed the AP, I, I surveyed the AP research students. Um, there was payback for me looking at all of their surveys. And I surveyed the AP research students to really ask them, why are you taking this program? What benefits do you hope to get? And the 71 responses, 52 of them talked about developing an exceptional high school transcript. 57 talked about receiving the AP Capstone Diploma. Now the AP Capstone Diploma is aspirational based on all of the requirements to get it. So I wanted to follow up with them to ask them, like, if you receive only one or some of your anticipated goals, 
would you still consider this course a success, this program a success? And of the 69 responses, 56 said yes and 13 said no. And it's really interesting to continue to follow this and follow this program in, in the years to come to see the successes that these students feel and how it prepared them for colleges and some of the institutions that they actually go into, um, attend. And in addition, those skills that they develop that may help carry into their careers as well. Now, these are feedback from, this is feedback from the AP research students about the benefits they think the program has. I highlighted some of the areas that show um, the benefits they think the program has. It's also interesting to read that one of the students in the middle said that the diploma is really the only reason they're involved in the program. So if they ultimately don't get the program, that's not ideal. I'm in it, I'm in it to get the AP Capstone Diploma Distinction. And it will be interesting to see if that student um, feels that way after he or she goes to college, or if the students in general feel that way about how this program really helped prepare them for college and that first semester particularly as they make that transition into a high level institution. So again, as this number continues to grow, we're projecting 200 students in the program next year. We need to really be mindful that we continually challenge our students, but we make sure that we provide them the supports necessary to meet those challenges. I know it was a lot, but that's all I have. Absolutely impressive program. Oh. Uh, okay, we see uh, board members, comments, questions? No, I think a very impressive program. I think it's giving them a lot of the foundation skills that they need to be successful at college with respect to research, writing, analytical skills, and you know, public speaking, everything combined. And what's exciting is they get to choose a topic that's of interest to them. I think that's what happens, the day-to-day -day grind is when students get bored. And this is something where we can push them to achieve higher skills while keeping their level of interest. So it seems like a great program. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Trapani. That was, that was an outstanding presentation. Thank you for your, all your hard work. I had a couple quick questions. First of all, I echo Janine's statement about uh, so, uh, interaction, public speaking, pu public presentations. Those are skills that you're going to have to use the rest of your life. And the students who can do that early on are going to be that much farther ahead than other students. So I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, I know uh, uh, the AP Capstone's been uh, here for six years. It came out six years ago. It got here. It came out in 2014. Right. So fall of 2014 was the first time the College Board um, piloted it in institutions around the world. Uh, we started it in 2016. Okay. And then um, just looking to uh, like a perspective from you, how, how has it uh, evolved? Um, is there ongoing uh, evaluation from the College Board on how schools like Massapequa are doing? Are you able to provide feedback to College Board? And then, you know, is there ongoing training for the staff that you um, have for these students as it, as it continues to grow and flourish? Yeah, so um, as far as training for the staff goes, uh, one of the interesting things about the program is that as those students do their presentations, our, our own staff is evaluating them. And because our own staff is evaluating them and then sending those scores to College Board, uh, College Board asks that the teachers are trained every year. Um, so in AP Seminar, to provide that support, we have a co-teaching model where two teachers are in every class working with these students, and they get trained every year to be able to evaluate them based on the requirements from College Board. AP Research, we have uh, three teachers teaching the course, and they get trained every year as well. Uh, I did attend a, a workshop in the fall um, hosted by College Board, and specifically I went there to really talk to um, some of the uh, admissions officers and, and, and presidents of institutions about the impact that AP Capstone has and how they view it, and to make sure that it's something that's being viewed favorably by these institutions, and it certainly is. Um, College Board is obviously excited about the program. Uh, it's certainly something where the rigor kind of speaks for itself, and it's something that we'll continue to evaluate going forward. And as these students graduate, and this is honestly our first graduating class of students that are taking AP Capstone, seeing their successes in college and seeing their reflections on the program you know, in the immediate future will really help us determine its value. Great. I, you know, I look forward to hearing that data on, on those students who go to college and provide uh, feedback to you yeah. about how well it's preparing them yeah. while they're in college. I look forward to hearing back. No, that. that would be exciting, too, and it's something that will maintain communication with those students, and really the goal will be after the first semester to reach out to them 
to ask if they feel the, if the impact was something that was noticeable in their first semester. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, how you doing? Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very thorough, and the questions that I did have, you kind of touched on, because uh, my son's going to be in this class next year. Right, um, so we're excited. Um, the AP seminar. Yes. Uh, so um, one of my concerns was that they weren't. He wasn't taking it in English class. And so you said that they are doing better. They they do better on the regions. Do you know why, or do you think they're lacking in literature skills or anything? Yeah, and it, honestly, that's something that we considered early on. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, as we offered it as a core English class. Mm -hmm. um, but really, when we look at the skills. And when we look at that first slide where it shows the skills from AP Capstone and how they transfer into the other disciplines, one of the ones that was up there is uh, AP Language. Mm -hmm. And as students prepare for what they need to do to be able to succeed in AP Capstone, you're talking about a level of analysis they, they need to incorporate into readings that are given to them. Mm -hmm. That's not unlike what they would experience in their English course. Mm -hmm. um, now, it is something where if a student is really into literature and poetry. There's obviously going to be less of that with AP Capstone. Mm -hmm. We do try to fill that void after the AP exam by having more literature being brought into the classroom in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the skills needed to actually succeed on the English regions, mm -hmm. students that are in the AP Capstone program far exceed their peers. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Absolutely phenomenal program, phenomenal presentation. Um, I think we have 39 advisors with the increase that you're anticipating. Uh, are there more advisors available? Or, or do they volunteer, or how does that work? Yeah, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a great process to see because um, ultimately, it's a unique thing for students to ask an adult to help them with their research paper um, where there can be a level of academic insecurity. So what we do is we want to make sure the students are as comfortable as possible. And the way we go about that is, um, I ask the teachers to um, let us know that they're someone who would be interested in working with a student. The students know the list of teachers who are interested in being an advisor. And then really it's the student who reaches out to the teacher um, with a form that's signed saying this is my topic and this teacher is willing to work with me. So that the student gets to pick the teacher, the faculty member that he or she is working with. Now there are some cases where a teacher didn't volunteer initially, but a student went up to him or her and said, I'd really be, like to work with you. Here's my topic. Um, I would like to work with you on it. And in every case, the teacher uh, agreed to do so. Hmm. Um, so it's been pretty great to see unfold this year. And I can't imagine the amount of pride a teacher has as they see that student go through the yeah. system and the end result knowing it's a reflection of them as well. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and when the students actually present in AP research, on the panel will be their advisor. And the reason why we're doing that is because it's also a friendly face. Mm -hmm. This is someone who's worked with them for the last four months. So they're there as someone to kind of help root them on as they go through their presentation. S sounds good. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Yeah. And uh, may I just add, because Dr. Trapani is, is far too humble um, to say this, the, the way this implementation actually um, went down was with such thoughtful precision. Uh, every aspect was considered before this program was launched. And uh, that is uh, just a, a, a wonderful uh, because of w we see such success in less than three years, the, the accolades need to go to those who were involved in bringing it to the district. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next discussion will be a policy 8414.5, alcohol and blood testing of drivers. Mrs. Valeri is not here, so I believe Mrs. Iconis will take that one. Yes, this is um, a draft policy for the board to consider. I should start by saying Ms. Silveri is home. She has that stomach virus that's circulating, not feeling that well. So this is a draft policy, Regulation 8414.5, Alcohol and Controlled Substance Testing of Drivers. Um, so what this actually does is it's the district's obligation under federal regulation 
for drug and alcohol testing for bus drivers, as well as certain other employees specified in federal regulations. Okay, please note that this policy does not apply to our transportation department because we contract with educational bus transport. Any company contracting with the district to provide transportation to district students is responsible for conducting alcohol and drug testing required under federal law and regulations. So this evening we are asking the board to consider revising the policy in accordance with updates to federal and state law. And of course, legal counsel has reviewed everything. Okay. Board members, any questions, comments? No. Okay, and I guess it'll be up on a future agenda for Yes, approval. it will. Um, I believe, uh, yes, it is May 9th that you will be adopting, the board will be asked to adopt this policy. Okay. Thank you. And the next informational item will be a discussion of the 2019-20 school budget. Uh, Mr. Adcock. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good evening, Massachusetts community. Um, today marks our, tonight marks our third budget presentation in the development of the 2018-19 budget. The slide up on the screen right now represents a summary of the current year's budget, and you can see that on March, uh, February 7th, we went over the general support sections of the budget, as well as people transportation, community services, employee benefits, debt service. Um, on March 7th, we then came back and went over the entire instructional component of the school district's proposed budget. And then tonight, we're here March 21st. We will go over, if need be, all of the sections of the budget, but primarily focus on the revenue. That would be the tax levy, something called pilot payments, local revenue, state aid, reserves, and the designated fund balance. Before we get into the numbers, some financial facts with regard to Massapequa schools. Um, the Board of Education back in January of 2000 adopted a financial plan, and we've been working with that financial plan since. We've had two revisions of that financial plan in February of 2008, as well as April of 2015. And the um, Citizens Budget and Finance Committee is currently working on an update that uh, is anticipated to be presented to the Board of Education in April for, uh, for approval. For the last four years, the district has uh, developed and adopted, the board has adopted a reserves plan, and that was uh, most recently uh, adopted, readopted in December of 2018. With regard to taxes, um, next year will be the eighth year of the New York State tax cap. During that period of time, the district has taxed $4.9 million below where the New York, New York State tax cap amount would have allowed us to be. So in the eighth year, uh, we're still going to be at or below, or actually below, slightly below the New York State tax cap level. And that will help us with the next bullet point, and that is to be in compliance with the New York State tax freeze slash credit program. It's a program that's been in place now for several years. Uh, next year, um, the school district being at or below the tax cap level is in compliance with that and that enables um, eligible residents to get a rebate check from New York State. That rebate check typically comes in the October, November timeframe, and next year there is some significant money uh, associated with that, up to in excess of $1,000 if you are, uh, have a household income less than $75,000. It's now a percentage of the STAR, uh, uh, star um, exemption, and that could be uh, in excess of $1,000. So we are in compliance with that so our residents should, uh, should expect those checks if they're in compliance. We are in good standing on the New York State Comptroller's Fiscal Stress Monitoring Report. I just want to note that there are 26 districts that are within New York State that are in some form of fiscal stress or distress. We are not one of those districts. 
So uh, we're in good shape with that. We also have an excellent Moody's credit rating. Um, our credit rating is a double A1 credit rating, which is an outstanding credit rating. Most recently, um, Moody's prepared their um, issuer copy. This is dated March 1st, 2019. And I'll just read a, a brief paragraph to give you what they said about us in our credit overview. It says, and I quote, Massapequa UFSD's credit position is very good. And its double A1 rating, double A1 rating is higher than the median rating of double A3 for school districts nationwide. The notable credit factors include a very strong wealth and income profile, very strong wealth and income profile, an ample tax base and a sound financial position. The rating also reflects an exceptionally light debt burden and a, a moderate pension liability. So some good things that are being said about us um, through the financial circles on Wall Street, I think all those things are things that we can be uh, ex extremely proud of. Where the AA1 rating will help us is that when we go out to borrow for bonds, it provides the school district with a very, very competitive uh, interest uh, rate. And so um, those interest rates, particularly on a bond that can be 15 years, just a, a couple of basis points can be hundreds of thousands of dollars or more in interest costs over the life of that bond. So that's a, a real good place to be for us. With regard to how we spend our money or allocate our resources, 81% um, of our resources are dedicated towards student programs, as you would expect a school district's resources to be dedicated to. That's followed up with 11.4% for facilities and capital improvements, maintenance of our schools, what we fix in our buildings and so forth and so on, and 7.6% uh, allocated towards administration. This next slide is a slide that I have um, put up a number of times and it gets updated each year. Um, the data on that slide comes from this report it's called the BOCES Annual Study of School Costs. And basically what it does, that slide does in, in, uh, in rank order, there are 41 K-12 school systems in Nassau County, and each one of those K-12 school systems have a per pupil cost or a, an expenditure on a per pupil basis. So when you look at that graph, we are number 14 of 41 K-12 school systems in Nassau County. So the average for the 41 districts is $30,193 per student spent. Massapequa is spending uh, $27,456 in the 2017-18 school year, according to that report. So it's about $2,700 less than the average district spends on a per pupil basis. If you multiply that by the number of students we have, which are uh, approximately 6,800, you get about $18.5 million. So to get us to where the average spending of the average district, we would have to add about $18.5 million to our budget. I am not advocating that. I'm just presenting this graph to show you that, um, that we spend frugally and that the community is getting good value for its money, particularly in light of, of all of the wonderful programs in this district, um, some of which you've had a snapshot of tonight, our instructional program, uh, AP Capstone, as well as our scholar athlete teams and our championship teams. So with regard to the 2019-20 budget, we're going to continue to provide all programs and services, something that we've been able to do under the tax cap very, very successfully. Elementary enhancements, some are enhancements that we've had for a year or two, some are brand new. So we've had some enhancements in the K-12 science program over the last uh, one to three years. We have a new math program that the superintendent mentioned um, at the beginning of the meeting. Looking forward to that. We're a district that um, has mobile technology in place. When you look at the number of school districts in Nassau and Suffolk County, where literally from kindergarten through 12th grade, and as you get into the, um, you know, the higher elementary grades where the students actually have their own Chromebook, we are one of few districts that, that really have that program and, and we've implemented it very, very successfully. It is a very powerful instructional tool. Foreign language program at the elementary level, uh, kindergarten art, music library, and a favorite is makerspace, that creative time um, that students have during the day at the elementary level where they can, they can create. At the secondary level, Dr. Trapani's excellent presentation showcased 
um, the AP Capstone Program, and we have a tremendous amount of advanced placement course offerings, I think, with the exception of one or two AP courses, we offer every single AP course available. Am I close to that? Yeah. Right? I think it's there's maybe two courses we don't offer. Okay, so we offer all of the AP programs with the exception of one. As, as uh, we mentioned, the capstone program, studio art at the secondary level, another exciting initiative, a partnership for the last year or two with Hofstra University. Massapequa High School students can actually take the Hofstra University engineering course at Massapequa High School, be mentored by Hofstra University professors who collaborate with our teachers uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for our students. This is a favorite of mine, L-I-H-S-A. It stands for Long Island High School of the Arts. You may know that as the school in Syosset. Uh, it used to be called the Cultural Arts Center in Syosset. That school over the last couple of years has been faced with um, closing several times. I believe Billy Joel is a big benefactor to that school and he has provided that school with funding. And I'm proud to say that of any school district uh, that attends that school, we send the most number of students to the Long Island High School of the Arts. So whether you are interested in um, a college degree and the sciences, whether you're interested in sports and you become a scholar athlete in this district, or if you're interested in the, the arts, musical theater, we have a program where all of our students can excel and we, we send that. Not all districts and actually probably um, not many districts support musical theater and the arts programs like Massapequa supports it. Let me speak about security enhancements because this is a topic um, that is very, very, very important to everyone in this room. Back in 2007, um, shortly after the Virginia Tech shootings, I went to the superintendent of schools and said, what's happening in Virginia is really bad. I wonder how we're positioned. I think we need to have a threat and vulnerability assessment done of Massapequa schools. So with the support of the superintendent at that time and the Board of Education, a firm was commissioned to come in and do a threat and vulnerability assessment in 2007. Based on the results of that threat and vulnerability assessment, we stepped off a new program in 2010 where um, we uh, stopped using a vendor for our in-house security guards, and we hired our own trained law enforcement professionals, whether they be retired or active law enforcement, to be the uh, security guards and dedicated those security guards in each and every one of our school buildings. I can't tell you over that past eight years, eight or nine years, the intel that has come to this district surrounding security. I, c I don't know how we did without, without that intel um, prior to 2010, but it has been tremendous and uh, it has been very well received by the, by the community and ve been very helpful to, to, uh, to our team, to our staff. Um, we've implemented student and staff ID cards at the secondary level. You know if you visit our schools, we now have our entry vestibules. We do extensive emergency management planning um, with our staff. Each year there is a, uh, a guidebook that is specifically updated for our staff and we train with that um, emergency planning guidebook. We are monitored 24 hours through video surveillance, approximately 550 or so cameras throughout the school district and an excellent communication system. We've installed new classroom doors and hardware. That project has been completed. We have practice drills, we train, and most recently this year, we've added armed security guards to the perimeter of our school building. So um, I was pleased to hear um, a few nights ago that um, apparently the police commissioner of Nassau County was at some kind of a forum and actually by name mentioned Massapequa schools as having, mentioned us as having an outstanding security protocol. Um, and I, I think that that's a real credit to everyone who has been involved in each one of these bullets and there are just so many more but with space considerations, too many to list, improving the security program in this district um, tremendously over the last eight years. Some achievements, some recognition and awards with, for Massapequa schools. You, you've seen these before, and this is really just a snapshot of, 
of some of the things that we can be proud of as far as recognition and awards. The college boards, the AP capstone, we've made the advanced placement honor roll twice in 2011 and 2013. In 2016, Massapequa High School was named a top 500 high school by Newsweek. The US Department of Education, East Lake, many years ago, but most recently, last year, Massapequa High School awarded blue ribbon status by the um, uh, US Education Department, a tremendous achievement for Massapequa High School, something for everyone to be proud of. The uh, New York State Public High School Athletic Association, our school of distinction for our scholar athlete teams. You saw uh, those scholar athlete teams on display tonight, something also to be very proud of. And uh, the Arts New York State School of Music Association, 2016 Massapequa School for a Presidential Citation Award. Now the numbers. So um, with regard to uh, some selected budgeted costs and some increases with, with regard to those costs, things that I consider drivers in the budget, what tops the list is a decrease in pension costs, the TRS rate, teacher's retirement system rate went down by about 16.6%. The rate went from 10.62, next year it'll be 8.86, that's a 16.6% decrease. So you see that uh, the budget is uh, about 1.5 million less. Health insurance uh, up by 666,000. Salaries up by 1.78%, uh, 1,934,000. Contracted transportation, an increase of $348,000. The armed security guards is something that were not in the budget last year, uh, but we did step off with the program. Uh, that's 575,000. And with regard to um, special education, tuition and related services, that's both these, it's uh, public and private placements as well as related services. And the need, the program has just uh, exploded uh, over the last couple of years. Um, we need an increase of 2.2 million within special education because of the uh, tremendous um, the additional need within that, uh, that program. So with regard to budget discussion one, okay, you see that uh, this is this year's budget and next year's budget. This is the, gen the first general support budget. We have an increase overall in total of 338,000. Budget discussion two, which was the instructional budget, uh, almost 3.9 million as an increase. Um, total increase 4.227, most of it within instruction, that is a very good thing. And an overall budget increase of 2.12%. When the property tax report card is released, there is a number on that property tax report card that is populated by New York State Education Department, that is the CPI number. That CPI number is at 2.13. Our budget increase is 2.12, so we are right at a CPI increase with regard to our costs. Looking at the budget in a little bit of a different format, you've got the general support, the instruction, pupil transportation, community services, employee benefits area, debt service, and uh, special ed school lunch transfer. Um, again, that is the 2.12%. With regard to things that we are speaking about new tonight, and that is the tax levy, the recommended um, tax levy increase is 2.87% just slightly below where the tax levy cap is for us at 2.89. I wanna explain um, this, this pilot payment, it's called payments in lieu of taxes. There are um, agreements between uh, several companies with regard to, not, not between Massapequa schools, but between um, Nassau County and or the town of Oyster Bay and so forth, um, three particular properties that have come off the tax rolls and instead of being taxed under the tax rolls, they, they pay a flat amount of tax. Um, so that's 2,998,000. But they've come off the tax rolls. Again, we receive their taxes through a flat rate. Um, local revenue, which is made up of uh, things like rental income from the Hawthorne School, interest income, refund of BOCI services, um, summer rec program tuitions, driver ed uh, tuitions, that makes up a small percentage of revenue uh, for our schools. Um, state aid, which we have a small increase budget to budget with regard to state aid. Um, use of reserves, um, there are three reserve accounts. Uh, the tax reduction reserve, 
which is, which is a reserve that was created from the sale of the Carmen Road School, um, the retirement uh, reserve, as well as the workers' comp reserve, and then the designated fund balance. So those are the, those are the six components that make up the revenue stream of Massapequa schools. So let's talk a little bit about state aid for a moment. How much support does New York State provide? I've been at a number of workshops and uh, seminars um, this season, and basically from the Superintendents Association to PTAs and so forth, um, they have highlighted the fact that Long Island as a whole has 17% of the students in New York State, but only receives 12% of the aid. So it's 17% of the students and 12% of the aid. And that gap makes up a huge amount of money. But Massapequa gets about 15% of its cost paid for by state aid. But with regard to Massapequa, how much, how much aid does the average student get in New York State and how much aid does the Massapequa student get? <coughs> so from presentation, I took some numbers and I looked at the total amount of state aid in the current year, which is about 26.6 billion and the number of students in total in New York State, which is about 1,250,000, I divided the number out. So if you just look mathematically, you would see that if the aid was distributed, if every student in the state gets the same amount of aid, that aid would be $10,180 per student. Then I looked at Massapequa, and I looked at our budgeted state aid divided by the number of students that we have in the current year, and Massapequa gets, per student, about $4,471, or less than half of what the aid is per student, if every student in New York State was to receive the same dollars. And you do the math, and you take 6,767 students is what we opened with this year, what our beds date is, uh, our, our beds enrollment, times the 10,180, and then subtract out what we currently get. If we were getting $10,180 per student, it would drive $38.6 million more to Massapequa. I can tell you with factually that that would lower the taxes on the average home. That's a home that has an assessed value of $350,000 by $1,700 right off the bat. Now, I'm not going to take a position on whether you think that this is a good thing or a bad thing because Massapequa does not get its fair share of state aid. And there are many reasons for that. But um, certainly, uh, compared to other districts, uh, we don't get a lot of state aid. And the reason it is is because state aid is distributed based on something called the combined wealth ratio. And that combined wealth ratio looks at four factors. It looks at income wealth and property wealth. I read the Moody's report to you, and it said, it said um, we have a very strong wealth and income profile. So that translates to you're not a high needs district. They also look at how many free and reduced lunch popular, how many students we have that are on free and reduced lunch and we have very few. So they say, okay, you're not a, you know, you're not a needy district. And then how many non-English speaking students we have and we have very few. So by all four of those factors, we do not look like or we don't qualify as, an, as a school district in need. And so, um, we get less state aid. It's just the way the system works in New York State. Next, I want to talk to you about the school tax levy. If you looked at the numbers, the recommendation for the tax levy is this number, 163,666,959. So what is the school district's role? The school district's role is to, de to develop an annual operating budget and adopt a resolution by August 15th directing Nassau County to collect a school tax levy from the properties located within the boundaries of the school district. And in fact, um, if the board adopts this budget, and in fact, our tax levy is, again, this is just below where the tax cap is for us, 163 million, the Board of Education, at probably the first meeting in August, will sign a resolution directing Nassau County to collect 163.6 million, .7 million from the residents within this community. That's where the school district's role ends. Then comes the assessor's role, the Nassau County Department of Assessment. And that is to determine what portion of that tax levy, that 163.7 million, each property pays. 
So what they do first is they divide the tax levy amongst four property classes. There are residential class of properties, there are commercial class of properties, there are rental class of properties, and there are public utilities. So first, they divide the levy amongst those four property tax classes. And for some reason, every single year, there's a slight shift in the percentage of each one of those classes and how much each one of those classes pay. So when you add all four of the classes up, they pay 100% of the taxes. But for some reason, and I can say this factually since 1999, that percentage has been for residential tax payers, a residential class of properties has been going up. In 1999, it was about 73%. And last year, or I should say this year, it's around 85 or 86%. So that's a big shift. That's about a 15% shift. So say 15% of this number, it's a pretty big number. Th that is a shift made by Nassau County right off the bat over the last 18 or 19 years, pushing more taxes to the residential class of properties. Now once they figure out how much each, cl each class of property paid, then they assign a total assessed value to each property class. And then what they do is they divide the amount each, prop each class pays in, in total taxes by the assessed value of the class, and voila, they have the tax rate. And that's, Nassau County actually calculates that every year. The school district does not calculate that tax rate. So based on the annual changes in the percent of the tax levy assigned to each property class, and then the individual change in assessed value of each property compared to the change in assessed value for all properties within the community, within each class, taxes are gonna fluctuate up and down. And for the last number of years, um, you can look at the increase or decrease in people's taxes, pick any block in the community, and go to myproperty.com and look up what the, how the taxes fluctuate and you will find increases and decreases on every single block pretty much in this community. So overall, we're looking for an increase of 2.87%, um, just below the tax cap. But the way that 2.87% is gonna work out is some people are gonna pay more than that 2.87, some people are gonna pay less, and some people are gonna get decreases. That is just the way that the system works in Nassau County. I also wanted to just um, provide you with a graph or a bar chart. Again, this is right from this annual study of school costs. So I've looked at expenses, but I looked at, there's also a portion of the, of the report that looks at revenue. And it looks at the revenue or the taxes that support each pupil. So what I did was I looked at Nassau County as a whole. And when you look at the, all of the tax levy in Nassau County divided by all of the students in Nassau County, and these are all for the 56th district, $18,761 is the number, the average number for taxes supporting each pupil within the county. With regard to Massapequa, that's a little bit less. It's, it's $18,348. So from a tax perspective, we're about average in the county, a little bit less, a little bit less than average, about $413 less than average. But if you multiply that by the number of students we have, that $413, it's just under, or about $3 million, excuse me, $3 million in, in taxes. So if our taxes were $3 million more in the 2017-18 school year, we would be spending, um, you know, from a tax perspective, um, the taxes supporting each pupil would be, you know, would be at the county average. We'd have to add about $3 million. So we're in a, a, a reasonable place when it comes to taxes overall within the Massapequa community. This is the, uh, the budget calendar. So I've mentioned the, the last two budget presentations, presentation one in February, presentation two in March, presentation three tonight. Um, we come back on April 4th and the Board of Education is scheduled to adopt the budget. Then on May 9th, there is a budget hearing. Between April 4th and May 9th, the district takes the budget that the board has adopted and puts it into the, uh, the state's format and appends the required information to that budget. It's made available prior to the budget hearing on May 9th, the community's opportunity to come out and uh, ask questions. And uh, just so you know, this uh, certainly, it's required that a board adopt the budget, but the only required meeting up here with regard to the uh, budget presentations 
prior to the budget vote is this budget hearing. So the law allows a school district to prepare a budget and for a board to adopt the budget without any public input or any questions. And then the public's opportunity to come out and ask questions is at the hearing. We don't do it that way. We, we uh, historically, the district has um, encouraged residents to come out through the bu budget development process to ask questions and get an understanding of, you know, of the school budget prior to the board adopting the budget. Okay. What I'm going to do now before questions is I'm going to um, go into the presentation on the bond and then an opportunity to ask questions on the budget and, and, the, and the bond issue that's uh, up for your consideration tonight uh, to be included on at the May 21st meeting. So, let's put that up. Okay, so at the last board meeting, um, our architects, H2M, uh, and our facilities director, who are here tonight, um, presented to the, uh, to the board and the community some, uh, some projects, uh, some, some new projects and some existing projects that um, are um, asked and, and estimates for those projects, projects that we believe uh, within the school district that, that we need and that are necessary. Those projects consisted of um, an auditorium renovation at Massapequa High School. You folks are sitting in some of those seats. I think they were last renovated in 1996, but the, but the metal associated with those seats, I believe, are 1955. So um, our proposal with regard to this auditorium is a reno complete renovation of this auditorium. You may also notice with regard to the three large auditoriums we have in the district, McKenna, Burner, and this auditorium, the acoustics in this auditorium are really not that good. They're really very poor. So that renovation would include um, renovating the auditorium with good acoustics, new seating, new floor, stage, um, finishes, etc. cetera, um, something is needed. There's also something called a pond spillway reconstruction. We have a pond that's adjacent to the school. We're responsible for the spillway that goes underneath Merrick Road. That spillway is in very bad condition. It needs to be reconstructed. Um, the field here is new. It looks beautiful. We do not have a bathroom facility at the field. So the proposal is to add a field bathroom facility. We currently use porta potties here at Massapequa High School um, for our teams and any spectators that come. Um, we have some special education life skills classrooms in the district. And as part of the life skills program, we need to modify those rooms to include water in those rooms as well as sewer, uh, waste, sewer lines, so, uh, so we can run a true life skills program. And our students, uh, our special ed students in that life skills program learn life skills such as doing wash, uh, cooking, et cetera. And, uh, and, and that those life skills are important and we need those modifications in those classrooms. At Burner Middle School, um, we need a smaller auditorium renovation there, um, which would consist of stage, um, flooring, and seating, as well as the music suite. The music suite is original to Burner Middle School and uh, 1961. And so if you go into that music suite, if you go to the band orchestra side, the teachers are um, using that space very, very little for instruction because there's so much storage of musical instruments. There's so many musical instruments that don't have the appropriate storage space that the space really can't be used for, um, for good instructional space. So there is a renovation of the uh, music suite that is um, recommended. Ames, with regard to Ames, we're recommending some exterior entrance renovations. Uh, by the way, there are some boards here. These are preliminary boards that were prepared by, by the district architect, um, and so maybe some of you had an opportunity to look at them um, before the meeting started. Um, in central office, there's a, a reconfiguration of the central office that would provide uh, the appropriate privacy for employees 
and or new hires that come in to fill out paperwork and applications associated with payroll and benefits in a confidential way. It would provide a small conference room for, um, for our auditors to be in that conference room, whereas now um, the conference space is extremely limited in the central office, and so there's a, a recommendation of an office renovation. As well as, and those, so those are, those are the, new, uh, the, new uh, the new projects. With regard to the existing projects, the 2014 bond, uh, because of cost escalations, and the projects taking um, well over a year to be approved by the State Education Department um, ran short of funding. So there are um, five projects that are um, recommended to, uh, to be completed with regard to the 2014 bond. It has to do with the Network Operating Center and a genera generator at Massapequa High School for that. Uh, at Ames Air Handling Units uh, at Eastlake, a, a, a renovation of new canopy, masonry, and fencing at Fairfield uh, Fencing and Mechanical Work, and at McKenna School, um, the generator, uh, the electrical to the generator needs to be expanded so it can provide um, emergency generator to uh, a larger por portion of the building, as well as air handling units and some site work associated with the, um, the back of the McKenna School and the parking there. The estimated cost for, for all of the projects is $7.1 million. So when I presented at the last meeting, what the architect presented, the costs are the same. What's changed a little bit is the funding. Um, the recommendation is now to use more of our capital reserve fund, and there, thereby we would need to uh, borrow less money. So the recommendation for the funding is, I'm um, sorry that that's really small, but um, so from the capital reserve fund, we would just about exhaust the amount of money in the capital reserve fund and use $2 million Six hundred and fifty-four thousand four twenty-nine, about four hundred thousand more than what we had originally um, proposed. The funding for the bond issue would go uh, to a four-point-five million-dollar bond instead of a four-point-nine million-dollar bond. And so, with regard to that funding, let's just go through that. Um, with regard to the capital reserve fund and using. 2,654,000. What that would do is that would create a revenue stream of building aid over a 15 year period of 94,321. Okay? And the debt service associated with a $4.5 million bond issue is $389,067. Um, these projects, and because we're a public school, these projects are eligible for. Um, more than half of the costs paid for by New York State, or 53.3%, and that, that's our building aid ratio. It's what's called our selected building aid ratio, because the laws that are in place right now allow school districts to go back in its history, all the way back to the early 80s, and select the building aid ratio which was most advantageous, or the highest building aid ratio going back to the early 1980s. And for Massapequa schools, it was about 1982, and our building aid ratio was 53.3%. Now, since 1982, I guess in the eyes of the State Education Department, we've become a more wealthy or affluent school district. So if they were going to aid us on our current building aid ratio, it's about 34%. And there has been some talk with regard to New York State and the deficit that New York State is in to change the building aid ratio from the selected building aid ratio to the current building aid ratio. Something we heard about six or seven years ago when the state was in some, some, uh, some fiscal straits as they are now. But they're really in trouble, I think, now with a number of things um, not coming to fruition in New York State and many residents leaving. I think we were the number one state for three years of residents leaving New York State. So there's a real possibility, I feel, that there's a real possibility that they may change that from the selected building aid ratio to the current building aid ratio. And so these projects, from what I understand, um, if they were approved and we got building permits on these projects, is they would still be under the umbrella of the select building aid ratio, 53.3%. That's one of the reasons we're saying we should do these now. Also, uh, with the cost of construction, the cost of the construction, for the most part, is never going to be less expensive or cheaper than it is in current times because typically there's an escalation associated with capital construction work as time goes on. So, with regard to the funding, 
annual debt service, $389,067, okay? Less the annual building aid paid on that debt service, 53.3%, which would be 207373 which means the annual net debt service would be 181694 But now we have to take into consideration by using that money from the capital reserve fund, it unlocks building aid of 94321 a year. So you take that off the 181, the local share for the projects is 87373 And when you look at that, it's about $4 a year to a home that has an assessed value, not a market value, or not, a, you know, it's not what you could sell your house for, but has an assessed value, and it's about the average assessment in the community of $350,000, four dollars a year. So there's no question that it's an affordable, it's an affordable endeavor, and there it's affordable. It seems to be affordable to the community. So that is the, those are the projects. Um, like I said, our facilities director, Tim O'Donnell, and our architect, Joe Mile, from H2M is uh, here. And I'll be glad to answer questions, budget questions, or um, bond and project questions. <coughs> okay, board members, any questions on either the budget or the proposed bond? Tim, I have a question. So, um, on the budget, um, the number that we have here for state aid, you know, we don't know if we're actually going to get this. Uh, just like what, as you alluded to before, the $2.3 billion shortfall at the yep. state, um, as well as the, um, the fact that the governor has taken the legalization of marijuana out of the state budget. So what, are we, what do you anticipate? Do you anticipate this number going down and then, you know, well, adjusting um, the levy. The, the number that we're using right now really is the only number you can use, and that is what the governor's state aid proposal was, and that's from July of 2019. Um, we've met a number of times, we've been in financial forums with our legislators who say that they are going to not pres only preserve that number, but you know, there's going to be possibly more aid coming. So it has yet to be seen. I don't know. Um, I've got to tell you, I, I have not gotten any um, indications as to where the state aid number is. I think the biggest thing for the governor was him taking out the marijuana proposal and, and untying it or divorcing it from, from the state budget, which was a really good thing. And uh, I think all of the hard work of the PTAs and the school boards and people around the state rallying and saying, no, not for our kids not happening and a lot of pressure to the governor and, and taking that out um, I, I, I don't know what the state aid is going to be but April 1st is around the corner and um, you know we'll see what that brings and certainly as soon as I know you'll know um, and uh, with the bond so I'm over to the bond now uh -huh. um, so last year we approved a bond of 32 million in January last year yeah um, and then um, I know we've you know we've looked through all these and we know that these are things that need to, to be done and I'm happy to see that we're supporting the arts and special ed and um, and just structural uh, renovations that need to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but do you anticipate or when do you anticipate a, uh, another bond issue in the future? I mean, is this next year, the year after, that kind of thing? I would anticipate um, the, the next project the school district is going to need to embark upon beyond this probably going to be in about five to seven years, and that's going to be roofs. Um, my first year in this district, summer of 1999, the community smelled like tar because just about every roof in this district was, was done over the summer. You know, most of the roofs in this district was done the summer of 1999. And so you're looking at, you know, that's 20 years ago. And so the life of a roof is, you know, 25, 26, 27 years. So the, the next bond issue that I would anticipate is probably in five to seven years, and that would consist of, of roofs and, and, that type of, and that type of maintenance work. When you look at um, the interior of our schools, when you look at the, now with, this is with the, the bond, because it's already been authorized. You look at the classrooms, you look at the bathrooms, you look at the, the instructional spaces, the science lab, the air conditioning that's going in. I mean, we have an exceptionally well-maintained well -maintained district. 
And, and those, those projects, the project that's underway right now, will make huge improvements you know, in our classrooms. Classrooms that, for the most part, they're being done because they're original to buildings that are you know, 50, 60, 70 years old or more. And, um, and so you've got a couple of projects hanging out there, and that's why we, we, put a, uh, we proposed the bond issue. One of them you know, is this auditorium, the Burner Auditorium, the Burner Music Suite, and some other smaller projects throughout the district to, to you know, really, really get it to where it, where it should be and where it needs to be. And um, beyond that, I, I really can't, other than maintenance type work, which you know, Mr. O'Donnell will attest to, um, we have a maintenance budget. It's, it's in the budget that you're considering, uh, that, you're t that we're talking about tonight. Um, the maintenance is ongoing. We're not slacking on maintenance. We are keeping the buildings maintained up to a very high standard. Um, and just one last thing is that I know a lot of stuff because of the financial concerns years ago and we built up to a point where we're able to do this. Um, do we have a five-year plan or, or a ten-year plan of, of how we're going to, you know, circle back, like you said, to sure. the roofs, to the, you know, at some point the classrooms will become old again, you mm -hmm. know, do, you know, do we maybe not, well, it'll be maybe 20 years, but I'm just saying is, well, we go on, on a cycle so we don't wait until they're falling down uh, now that we're in a better position. Sure. Um, there is, an, and next year the cost is in the budget. Um, it's our time to do the what's called the five-year building condition survey. So that's where the law requires that you have a licensed architect go through every space and every square footage within the building and put together the five-year capital plan. So we do have a five-year capital plan. And if there were um, you know, critical things, that five-year capital plan you know, would identify those, those types of things. Alan, I had a couple questions. Thank sure. you. So do you have any, uh, looking at how this is going to be paid for, do you have any concerns? for us as a board on fully depleting at this point the capital reserve fund and then any recommendations after that is depleted? Sure. Um, and so, you know, in, in order to get the maximum amount of savings from the capital reserve fund by using that money, that's why the recommendation was, was changed. Um, as far as the, uh, the 2014 capital reserve fund, th that capital reserve fund will be, um, you know, you, there will, there's not any more money that can be deposited, so to speak, into that capital reserve fund. The most amount has been able to be deposited. And so what, um, what my recommendation would be down the road, possibly a year from now, is to ask the community to establish a new capital reserve fund. It doesn't mean that it has to be funded, money deposited into it, but just to establish the reserve and, and have the ink on the page in the school district books, the community needs to approve that. And so it gives the board some flexibility because if you have a new capital reserve fund and the, uh, the amount is yet to be established, if you have another reserve account, y you, would, you would be able to, and again, we'd have to look at the, uh, the law and, and speak to um, council about that, but what, what you probably would be able to do, for example, if you wanted to take some money from your employee accrued benefit liability, your workers' comp reserve, or another reserve account, you could have the flexibility of moving some of that money into the capital reserve if, if you needed to. In addition, it allows you to, uh, to start to plan for, uh, you know, for maybe the next five to seven years that if there are some surplus funds that we could deposit those into, uh, into that capital reserve fund. And so when that time comes, when the district does need to, to put roofs on the buildings again, um, again, w you could utilize a hybrid strategy like we've been using in the last two um, uh, projects, and that is use some capital reserve money, which unlocks building aid, and then, uh, and then fund the rest of it through a bond issue. It helps to defray the costs somewhat. Okay, thank you. Or uh, impact, I should say. Two other quick questions. So it's incredible. I, I know all the board members receive uh, dates of uh, original dates of the buildings here in Massapequa. It's incredible to think that, you know, for instance, the Ames. We're going to be upgrading Ames if this passes, and it's 70 years old. I mean, some people, you know, update their house every four or five years. So it's just incredible what's taken this time, and I think it's it's money going to be well spent um, as we upgrade our facilities. It's it's great as. Carrie mentioned that we spent a large portion of the budget on the on the athletics last last fund, mm -hmm. and this one will be arts and and uh, special education, which is great. Uh, the last question I have for you on the office reconfiguration: Could you comment 
and provide details on issues or concerns you have with privacy and uh, how or why um, this upgrade is needed. Sure, so when you look at the configuration of our payroll office and our benefits office and the way it's structured with account payable and so forth, um, we, we have people that are new to the school district, you know, coming into those spaces. Um, there's really no confidential area where they can go to have a conference with our benefits person and our payroll supervisor. Um, when they have to fill out paperwork, um, they, they literally stand at a counter, okay, and, and you know, and fill out their paperwork. And, and there's really very little separation from those, whether it be employees and or people, new people that we're hiring for you know, a variety of positions, there's, there's very little place for them to go within, that, within the business office to fill out um, information or to conduct business in a, you know, in a more confidential, private way. And so the, the renovation is, it's not new offices for administrators. That's not, that's not what it is at all. It's, uh, it's reconfiguring the payroll and the benefits department. The space there now was last renovated about 19 years ago. And so, um, you know, it's starting to get kind of worn. But in addition to that, it really doesn't provide the, um, the privacy and the confidential nature to be able to, to meet with or um, work with district employees um, with regard to their own payroll, their benefits information, et cetera. There's also spaces when it comes, we have um, auditors that come to the school district every two weeks to, uh, that's our claims auditors. So they audit the, um, the payments, the vendor payments that are made every single two weeks. It's a, it's a state requirement. And so, you know, we have no space for the auditors. They typically go into the curriculum office and use a conference room in the curriculum office. And that means, you know, the meetings that need to occur within the curriculum office um, is difficult and space is very limited. Thank you, Al. I too would just like to echo that I am pleased to see that we are starting to look at uh, expanding the facilities that we're looking to renovate and improve. I'm glad that we are looking at the arts and also at special education space. Um, one of the things I do want to point out, though one of the things that still is on here is related to the fields, is the field bathroom facilities. And that could be seen as something maybe that doesn't seem essential to many. However, it is something I think it's important to point out that's not just used during um, games, but also will be used probably during gym classes. And especially with um, new concerns in general in society regarding security, that it is better to be able to have something available for students and the staff um, that's outside as opposed to having to keep buildings open for people to go in and out of buildings. So um, with respect to that, it is something that I think is, is really more of an important nature, mm -hmm. not just something that's seen as just, just another fluff thing on a field, but we, we truly do need it. So, and thank you, and thank you for the more breakdown and detail and information regarding the projects. You're welcome. Yes, I, I just wanna say I was very impressed with the uh, packet that you guys sent home earlier in the week in regards to the, um, the enhancement of Ames's um, you know, the entrance over there on the uh, uh, Baltimore side. Uh, do you have a, a slide that you can put up for the uh, people? We don't have a slide, but we do have a board here that, um, you know, when you look at the, the, the Ames building is uh, 1949. Uh, and so when you look at the canopy, the canopy over Ames is, 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 in, is in very poor condition. It's, you know, it's cracking. If you look at the underside, you know, you see cracks in it. Um, as, as well as the building, you know, it looks like you're walking into a factory. And um, you see that the architect's rendering would, would really make it look much more collegiate and uh, would provide a new canopy uh, with uh, stanchions and so forth. And so that's, you know, that's the nature of the, of the renovation at the Ames School. I mean, a, the, canopy, the canopy needs some, right. you know, some work to begin with. And the, the security aspect of it as well. Yeah. Uh, something that I was impressed with. And also the fact that uh, those air handlers from the previous barn that were not in the, we were not able to do to, due to the cost, um, that air, that, so that's, that's really a safety issue. Totally a safety issue because that controls the quality of the air that's in that building where yeah, our kids are in. It's particularly the air, handles, air handlers within the gymnasium that, um, that need to be um, renovated or replaced. Right. 
and so again, that was that was part of the um, the 2014 bond that we were not able to, um, you know, do. Right. Okay. Board members, any other questions or comments? No, I think I think it was an excellent presentation. I, I think um, knowing the state aid, I think that the uh, all these enhancements and improvements are, are much needed for our district as we move to the next century and um, all are going to have a positive impact on our, our students and families that use these facilities. Mm -hmm. I agree and I think that the longer that we wait to do, oops, am I off? So <laughs> the longer we wait to do things, I think the harder that it's going to be. So um, I do see the need for us, if we can, to try to get this through now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agreed. Um, I think that 53.3 percent state aid is will be going away very soon okay board members um, two options we can go th does anyone need to go through the uh, budget line by line one more time or are we good we're good I'm, go I'm good yeah okay. okay with that then I'd like to open it up to the public for anything uh, related to the budget or the, the proposed bond issue any questions comments you may have uh, feel free to come up to the microphone. Just state your name for the record. Uh, anyone have any questions? Ms. Bruno. Um, Christine Perino, 230 Ontario Avenue. Um, just on piggybacking on Mrs. Wachter's um, concerns with the roofs, you said that in about five years. Mm -hmm. um, if you could just refresh our memory, were all nine buildings roofs replaced at the same time most not all of them but most of them were most of them yeah, so we're looking at probably of the roof. so seven well i can tell you back if you recall back in 1999 the bond issue was a 49.9 million dollar bond issue. and that's and exactly what i was going to ask you how and much and would it cost to replace seven roofs in five years that would be something that I would have to, you know, defer to the architect and, uh, you know, for them possibly to give us a proposal looking at, you know, five to seven years out what, uh, what you know, what they anticipate the cost of the roof to be replaced. Do you have a guess? That it wouldn't be a number that, um, you know, 20 years ago the costs were much different. I, I, do, I don't have a guess. I wouldn't even try. So, uh, so it was like 49 million, right? It was almost 50 yes, million. Yes, there was... The lion's share of those costs, because remember it was new roofs and I believe windows as well. A well, and I wanted, and I believe it was boilers. There was some, so uh, probably. Will the boilers also need to be replaced? No. I want to say about a third, and again, I'm just taking a stab in the dark, about a third of the bond issue were roofs back in 1999. Okay, so you're talking about a significant amount of money yes. coming in five now years. Now, right now, right now, we're, you know, we're not really, we're not having problems with the roof. And I certainly wouldn't advocate for replacing a roof that uh, that we're not having issues with. Okay. But if we saw that in five to seven years, that you know that we were starting to have some issues with the roof, um, I, I would certainly um, recommend that they that they be replaced, not before we're having problems. So I guess from from the planning perspective, um, you know, establishing another capital reserve fund, and when the time comes that the roofs need to be replaced. You know, we have some funding there to be able to do that. What's the life expectancy for the boilers? Commercial boilers can be like 30 or 40 years. So about the same as the roofs? Well, no, the roofs are about 25. 25. About 25 well, you're, you just said 30, so you're all within five years, so pretty What is Ms. What do you think, Mr. Similar. O'Donnell? Ro uh, boiler in a school? Yeah, I just remember yeah. when we went through it, it was 30 years and the roofs were 25. So now you're talking about of, about the, the same time. But one of the things now that we have in our schools that we didn't have when we when we replaced these boilers is that our, our schools are now all firing on natural gas, right. which is significantly, significantly cleaner than the oil that they fired on. Right. And so the wear and tear on the boiler, I believe, is also probably less with a, with a natural gas boiler than... But again, I'm not an architect or an engineer, so. Is that true? I believe for the next five, six years, we will have to replace some of the boilers and the roofs. Okay. So that's a significant cost as well. Mm -hmm. um, any bond issues that are coming up due? Because I know in the past we would roll them over. Yep. Expiring. So I have this slide up. 
And basically what this slide shows, it's as of um, March 4th is when this slide was put together, the outstanding debt service on all of our bonds. So when you look at this slide, you see that we've got serial bonds from 2010. Those were the serial bonds associated with the New York State Excel program. Yep. Al, can I just interrupt you for one second? Going back to Mrs. Perino with the roofs. Uh, if I recall correctly, with that Excel bond in 2010, we did the roof at Ames and we did the roof at Hawthorne, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was 1.8 million for the roof yeah. at Ames and 1.4 million for the roof at Hawthorne. That was funds paid out of that Excel uh, issue. I believe that was a grant, if I'm not it mistaken. Was. It was, but right. those are smaller roofs. Right. So you're right. talking about good size okay. roofs, yes. So, um, so we have um, the the serial bonds from 2010. That was an Excel program. There was n no additional taxes as a result of the Excel because it was a state program. Then we have um, we have the remaining bond issues that we have. We have a bond issue that expires. It was actually refunded in 2015. It was, a, I believe, an initially a 10.7 million dollar bond. Right now, there's uh, one point, almost 1.7 million principal outstanding. That comes due in the 2020-22 year, 21-22. Okay. We also have we refunded a serial bond. That was that 10, 10 million. 10, 10 million. Point seven. 10 point seven. So that million. that again was an okay. issue that was no additional taxes to the community because we had had a, another bond issue that had. Right. Expired. So that's in three years. That's, that's in three okay. years. Okay. We have um, a seven million dollar bond issue that matures in 2022-23. So we have to Okay, that was also no for additional taxes. At for the time 18 the million, bond. we're up to 18, okay. right? Um, then you've got the serial bonds from 2015-16. That was the $35.7 million bond issue from 2014. And so those don't mature in 2000 no, until 2031-32. Okay. Again, those were also, that bond issue was also no, no additional taxes um, when, uh, when we looked at it. No, so no, that's no. just my that's my concern. So you have 18 million retiring, which you can roll over, right. but you're looking at roof, seven roofs, and some boilers. So you're mm -hmm. looking at you know it could be it was 49 you know it could be 50 million dollars that we might need, and you'll have to float another 30 million and use the 18. But it, that's a concern. That's within five years. Mm -hmm. So. Your point's well taken. Yeah. Anyone else? Eric? Uh, Eric Gustafson, 63 Broadway. Um, I'm assuming the the bond, um, the 7.1 million would be one proposition, right? Is that correct? That, that's yeah. the recommendation, yes. I mean, a couple of the projects that are under that, specifically the spillway and the um, McKenna Foundation, Yes. those are, if the bond were not to pass, how would, what would sure. be the mechanism? Because those were only, yes, structure we, would not get, would get worse. We would, right, correct. We, we would have to look towards the district's operating budget for maintenance, uh, of which, um, you know, we would probably have to use uh, the lion's share of that, that maintenance budget in either grounds maintenance or building, rented, uh, building maintenance to do those projects. They, they would not be aidable. So you, you would not, um, you wouldn't get the 53.2% back if they're done as maintenance projects versus mm -hmm. capital improvements. Is there any thought of separating out those two projects as, as its own proposition? Because those are what I would just find as clearly needs uh, versus the other ones, which w would be nice, don't get me wrong, but I, I wouldn't put them on the same level as, as needs co uh, you know, of tho compared to those two. So to make sure those would have a better chance of passing. <laughs> Our recommendation would be to, you know, to put it up as one, um, seven point one million, mm -hmm. you know, funded. Logistically, I understand it being easier, mm -hmm. but I'm just concerned um, if the community is ready for another bond one year after passing forty million, um, and then these two jobs, were, you know, s a lot of this work would be nice, but those two specifically come to my mind as critical. Mm -hmm. So that's just my thought. Yeah. Anyone else, Ms. Cardale? Alley at Nine Dover Road. Um, a couple of things. The bus contract is now included in this budget. A couple, yes. a couple of meetings ago, we talked about cameras. In yes. Is that part of this? What the cameras I mean are part of the budget. Um, tonight there is a um, a, um, a 
a resolution um, that the bu we had to meet with the bus company, and the bus company did agree to extend one more year beyond next year. So for the 1920 year, we have a CPI extension, and tonight, uh, hopefully, the board will act on an extension for 2021. Uh, but the bus company was not willing to go beyond 2021 with regard to a contract extension. So can you give us any more information on the cameras or on the yeah. costs, what's included? Sure. I mean the, the, the cameras, these would be uh, two cameras on each one of our buses. Um, the cost of the camera is uh, approximately $1,200 per bus. So it's two cameras. It's one camera that is mounted at the front of the bus that shoots from the front to the middle or to the back, and another camera that's mounted at the back of the bus and shoots from the back towards the middle and you know towards the front. Um, the images are absolutely crystal clear and it includes sound as well. And so I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. So we we own the cameras, the bus no, company the owns bus company, this is a this is a service that we're buying from the bus company. So we don't we do not own the cameras. Um, you know the, this is a, a, a private vendor. Um, you know, they would not allow our district to, you know, to, to buy cameras and go into their buses and, and, you know, mount the cameras. So the cost of the camera includes the purchase of two cameras. It includes all of the installation in two cameras and, uh, you know, whatever maintenance during the year. Um, so how much extra was that? That's 1200 per bus? It's about 140000 was in the budget for the cameras. Okay, and that was the increase in... 113 buses. In subsequent years, it's not 1,200. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a little less than half that for maintenance. Okay, um, just two more points. Um, when we talk about, to Ms. Perino's point about all the upcoming boilers and roofs, it just, uh, as a resident, and I'm sure a few people thought about this. I don't understand how last year we were talking about putting so much money into a pool when we know we have all these things coming up. I mean, the pool seem, seem like a luxury. So, our plan. For Fiscally, financially, are we taking care of that stuff before we look? Sure. Uh, you know, with regard to the pool, um, you know, it, it was a kind of thing where, where there was a, a cohort of, of individuals that wanted the pool. And, you know, the, the decision was made to put it up to the voters and let the voters decide, which I think was a, f was a fine thing to do. And the voters told us, we don't want a pool, and that's fine as well. Okay, just something for everybody we, to we think we actually about. Had a, we actually had a security issue in regards to our students um, being trans not our, our kids were safe, yep, but we had I an issue that. at Brentwood yeah. where they were over there. Right. And uh, so a sec yeah, obviously you remember right. a section of the community wanted us to throw up a pool, and we put, the, put it up, and right. they overwhelmingly said, we don't want it. Just one quick last. Why, sure. why was the life skills special ed not included into the classrooms last year with, those, with that 2018 bond? Well, with, with regard to the classrooms, they moved into um, classrooms that are located um, in a new portion of Massapequa High School. At class the life skills. School. Yes. They will move to a new portion. Yes, a new portion of Massapequa High School. Um, it was a classroom addition. So the classrooms are relatively new. I want to say they're maybe seven or eight or nine years old. Okay. Um, but, but they don't have um, water in the classrooms and they don't have, you know, um, sewer okay. uh, disposal in the classrooms. Right, so which we need. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Ms. Sheffield? Diane Sheffield, 34 Roy Avenue, Massapequa. Um, to touch on a little bit of what Tina was saying, last year we passed this big bond, and I don't understand why. I, I saw the pictures of Ames and the foundation at McKenna. That's not something that happened in the last year. Why why don't we didn't we dress that last year? Because it's costing us more money just to go out for a bond this year. Shouldn't everything have been handled? I know I, I don't know about you, Gary. You say you renovate your your house every four years. I don't do that. I am Joey. I'm Joey. Okay, I misunderstood you then. But when I do my house, I look at everything that I need to do, and I don't go back and and piecemeal things. Uh, you know, we're adding a comfort station after the fields where. We're now doing a bond. It just seems like poor planning to me. You know, this stuff should have been included last year and saved us the money and the cost of going out for another bond. And I agree with Eric. Let's separate things. You guys wanted to originally lump the pool in with everything else, and we said no. Give us a choice. L not Don't say it's all or nothing. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay. Okay, thank you, Alan. Okay, that'll bring us to the uh, resolutions. Uh, if anyone has anything they need clarification on, any resolution? Yes, number five. Anyone else? Okay. Number one, resolve that the Board of Education approve the IEP recommendations as per the attached. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number two, resolve that the Board of Education approve a contract with business technology professionals to provide services, deliverables, and or products as described in the attached contract and authorize the board president to execute said contract. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number three, resolve that the Board of Education designate Long Island Business News as an official newspaper of the Massapequa School District. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number four, whereas the Massapequa Board of Education wishes to update their policies in accordance with New York State School Boards Association's law and management policies for schools format and wishes to provide guidance and policy that meet the needs of the district, be it hereby resolved that the Massapequa Board of Education replaces policy 1900, Title I, no child left behind, parental involvement with policy 1900, parent and family engagement as per the attached. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number five, resolve that the Board of Education accept the attached addendum dated March 6, 2019 to the R.S. Abrams and Company LLP engagement letter for auditing services for the year ending June 30th, 2019. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Mr. Adcock, can you elaborate on that one? Sure. For uh, about the last five years or so, um, you've had an, an outside vendor prepare and work with R.S. Abrams to prepare the district's financial statements for the annual report. Prior to that, um, accounting firms were allowed to, and they did prepare those as part of the as part of the annual audit. About five years ago, there was an accounting pronouncement that said that the um, the the auditing firms couldn't prepare it, and then uh, just became known to me that um, there is now a new accounting pronouncement that once again allows the external auditor to prepare the financial statements with various sign-offs and oversight by management. And so the recommendation is to once again have R.S. Abrams prepare the, um, the district's financial statements and um, annual reports. Um, and the reason uh, for doing this is that it's, uh, there's a cost savings involved. Thank you. Board members, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number six, resolve that the Board of Education award a one-year contract extension for school year 2020-2021 for large bus service, routes 25 to 56, plus activity and sports trips to Educational Bus Inc. at consumer price inc increase set by New York State as documented in the attached correspondence. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number seven, resolve that the Board of Education award a one-year contract extension for school year 2020-21 for large bus service, routes 1 to 24, plus activity and sports trips to Educational Bus Transportation, Inc., at a consumer price increase set by New York State, as documented in the attached correspondence. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> Number eight, motion to approve this secret resolution for a capital improvement project consisting of various capital improvements at Massapequa High School, including auditorium renovation, spillway reconstruction, field bathroom facilities, special education life skills classrooms modifications, and central office renovations. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? 
Alan, could you just elaborate on this one? Sure. Um, CEQRA is called the State Environmental Quality Review Act, and local school districts uh, now probably for the last seven or eight or nine years have are the lead agency to have that CEQRA review performed. Um, our um, architects, H2M, have, have reviewed any environmental impact and have deemed these type two projects which have no environmental impact. Okay. Any questions? And, and that's going to be consistent uh, in the rest of the CEQA resolutions that, that you read. They have all been deemed by the architect to be type two actions with, uh, with no environmental impact. Okay. okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay, number nine. Motion to approve the CEQA resolution for a capital improvement project consisting of foundation repairs at McKenna Elementary School. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number 10, motion to approve the CEQA recommendation re resolution for capital improvement project consisting of auditorium and music suite renovations at Burnham Middle School. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number 11, motion to approve the CEQA resolution for a capital improvement project consisting of an exterior entrance renovations at High School Ames campus. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> Number 12, resolve that the Board of Education hereby directs the submission of a bond composition at the annual district meeting and election of qualified voters of the Massapequa Union Free School District to be held on May 21st, 2019, and the proposition be inserted in the notice of such annual district meeting and election as per the attached. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Number 13, resolved that the annual school district election of Massapequa Union Free School District, Town of Oyster Bay, Nassau County, New York, shall be held in various election districts and said school district for the purposes set forth in the annex notice, the form of which is hereby approved and it is further resolved that said notice be published four times within the seven weeks preceding the election the first publication be made March 27, 2019 in the Massapequa Post, the Massapequa Observer, and the Long Island Business News, three newspapers having general circulation in the district. As it is further resolved that Timothy Taylor is designated a permanent chairman of election in accordance with section 2025 of the educational law. And is further resolved that inspectors of the election be appointed more than 10 days prior to the voting date. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have correspondence we received from Amy Italiano, uh, Allison Crowley, Mike Crowley, and Tina Cordali. And with that, that will end our business part of the meeting. So the Board of Education allows time at the conclusion of its regular meeting for comments from residents in attendance. Please note that any person wishing to speak during this time shall comply with all provisions of board policy. Although a total of 30 minutes is allowed for comments, the board president has discretion to adjust the total time. We remind you to keep your comments to three minutes and to conduct yourself in a respectful manner. Please address school matters only and refrain from addressing topics related to personnel matters or individual students. Such concerns should be discussed privately with the superintendent or administrator at an appropriate time. The board is here to listen and cannot provide immediate feedback or engage in open dialogue. Any necessary follow-up will be noted and provided at a later date.